I think it's finally time to talk about the reason why I started making YouTube videos. I know a lot of my previous videos have consisted of various forms of bashing new shows, but today, I want to change all that with my first two-part video. What do you know about the Looney Tunes show? I don't personally know more than five people who have watched this, and I think that's criminal. But on the other side of it, that might be why the show is one of the best modern cartoons out there. That doesn't make sense, Mel, you say? To which I just laugh and ignore you and hope you'll move on from that statement. This show was allegedly cancelled due to poor reception by the Warner Bros. executives. Looking at the show they replaced it with and approved, their rejection of the Looney Tunes show is all the street cred you need right there, baby! Also, it was kind of expensive to make, but you can see where every dollar went when you watch it, so that does not count to me. Quality costs money. Now, I've seen what happens to massively popular shows out there in current year Hollywood, and all I can say is, y'all better stay ignorant about this show's actual cult classic status. You will not mess this one up for me. I tried to explain the genius of this show to my circle of friends who are into animation, and they would just not hear it, because they think it somehow defiles the sanctity of the original Looney Tunes by merely existing. So here I am, making videos about it and hoping they'll watch and change their minds. To all my hater friends, this one's for you. I'm making this a two-parter because the show ran for two seasons with 26 episodes each, and I'm not trying to create an hour-long video here, but I also want to give it the respect it deserves. So, the show is a full-blown sitcom, kinda like Cougar Town, that follows a defined structure with a cold open, followed by the start of the episode after the opening credits, then they go into a musical interlude somewhere in the middle to honor the Merry Melodies musical segments of the 1930s, back then in the time before color when the world was still black and white. No, seriously, ask your grandparents. The world actually was black and white the way you see it in the movies. There was no color back then. The Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies were separate segments that were inspired by Disney's early animation, like the Silly Symphony musical segments. But back to the show's structure, there is also a brief 3D Roadrunner segment that stays faithful to the original Roadrunner cartoon. After these segments come the rest of the episode and the closing credits. Off the bat, it's already clear that the creators of this show had great reverence for the Looney Tunes that came before them, so I'll not bury the lead here. It was clearly made by very talented and passionate people who put a lot of thought and care into these iconic characters. When you're the custodian of a property with almost a century of animation history behind it, it's a big responsibility that should be taken very seriously. Also, contrary to popular opinion after the show was cancelled, I would personally not want this show to come back for the same reasons I gave in my Top Cat video. We have a very rewatchable, instant classic show right here that is wrapped neatly in a perfect two-season, 52-episode bow. You will never say that this show overstayed its welcome. I can share this with my kids one day without the fear of some, let's say, eccentric Hollywood person getting their hands on it and mutilating it. To the team that worked on this show, from Tony and Hugh, to the voice actors and the musical talent and the animators, I can't shout you all out individually because that's just not a thing I do here. But I hope wherever you are, you all know that you came together and you made something truly special. So we've wasted enough time already, which is something I don't like to do. Let's get into season one of the show. It starts out introducing the audience to Warner Bros. biggest mascots in Bugs and Daffy, who live together as housemates. Bugs is very wealthy and retired early after inventing the carrot peeler, and Daffy is a freeloading sponge who has been temporarily crashing with Bugs for five years. You know, like temporary guests usually do. Bugs has historically been the poster boy for the Looney Tunes, and Daffy has always been seen as wacky, selfish, and greedy, so this dynamic fits their characters perfectly. If I'm to inject my opinion in here, I was always a Daffy guy, and it's not cause he's black. <laughs> I hear racial humor is very popular these days. Bugs was always just too cool and sarcastic, which I found a little boring. Daffy, in contrast, was completely unhinged. A total lunatic. Anyone who knew me from high school and further back will tell you that I was a full-blown nuisance just like Daffy. Don't tell anyone, but he was kind of my role model growing up. Anyway, this show follows the evolution of Daffy from that ball of energy to a more understated lunatic. He was mostly just selfish, greedy, and lazy, but surprisingly capable when he focused on certain disciplines. We'll get into those in detail later. My mind is already racing ahead to some of my favorite episodes. There's also Speedy Gonzalez, who they did really dirty with that introduction. <laughs> Daffy was treating him like vermin every time he saw him. As another childhood favorite character of mine, they really expanded his role in this show in such a meaningful way. We'll also get into that. 
We meet Lola Bunny in episode 2, which was my sister's favorite episode. She used to watch it all the time. It was funny in a lot of ways, but the visual aesthetic was also a big motivator. You just enjoy looking at it because it was set at this swanky members-only club that Daffy managed to sneak into. Lola's introduction was very controversial to me when I first saw this show. I was completely taken aback by it, and I remember how unhappy it made me when they took the hottest bunny in the game and turned her into this clumsy little psycho. But boy oh boy did they turn me around on that really quickly. This is currently my favorite version of Lola, and I doubt Warner Bros will ever top it. The first appearance was just a little jarring to be fair, but the way her character developed over the next few episodes was just... Mwah. Chef's kiss. Funny girls are better than hot girls anyway. Yeah, said it. Come at me, bro. Her parents were rich and a little simple, which is polite for not very smart. And the rich part is why Bugs met her at this private club. But the relationship that developed between the parents and Bugs was very wholesome. I've just realized that I've signed up for quite a task here with the introductions because almost all the Looney Tunes characters make an appearance in this show. So let's wrap up the introductions. There's Porky, who is Bugs and Daffy's needy friend. Tina Russo, who is a new character to the Looney Tunes mythos, but she fit right in and became Daffy's girlfriend. There's also Yosemite Sam, who is Bugs and Daffy's horrible neighbor. There's the granny from Sylvester and Tweety. Then there's that witch, who is Gossamer's mother. There's Mark and Tosh, who run an antique store. There's Elma Fudd, who is a newsman. And Foghorn Leghorn, whose name I never thought I'd pronounce. I don't even know if I've done it right. But he was in the show as a gullible and wealthy entrepreneur who had a soft spot for Daffy. Taz is also in this show, but he's the only character that I'm slightly iffy about. Taz always seemed to me like a kid who just could not speak very well. But on this show, they decided to make him a pet. It makes sense because he was always a wild animal, but... I just feel a little weird about him being Bugs and Daffy's dog. It was not that big a deal anyway, so I was able to look past it. As you can probably already tell if you haven't watched this show, the town they lived in had a mix of anthropomorphic animals and people who are living together with no distinction between them. The tone of the show is very welcoming, light-hearted and wholesome. You can tell that the writers were raised right in very loving homes. <laughs> pew pew pew! Shots fired at some of your favorite cartoon creators. If you've watched my previous videos, it's becoming a recurring theme for me to say that season 1 was good, but season 2 is where the show took off and this one is no exception. We were mostly getting to know the cast in season 1, some of whom were characters that Bugs and Daffy were already familiar with, and others who they were meeting for the first time like the aforementioned Tina Russo, who just looks and sounds like a Tina Russo, and Taz, who first appeared like something out of a horror movie. The thing I enjoyed most about this show was how they took mundane, everyday experiences and made them funny and interesting. Like Bugs, Daffy and Porky's visit to the Grand Canyon, where a simple littering incident took them down a crazy road where they got incarcerated, escaped from prison and turned into fugitives from the law. This is where Daffy Duck's personality really started taking shape for me. I would share a clip, but those haven't gone very well for me with Warner Bros. content in the past. His interactions with Neanderthal-shaped head man were just too funny. Staying on the mundane, the episode where Yosemite Sam decided to switch to solar power was another really hilarious episode. And if you didn't know why Sam is always seen as a villain, this episode shows you why. He's every bad neighbor you've ever had and then some. Some of the jokes here would really make Mel Blanc and the Looney Tunes Godfathers proud. I want to really get into the character progression through the show in season 2, but anyone will tell you that Daffy and Lola were the most interesting characters in this show. Initially, it appears that Daffy will be the butt of a lot of jokes, but they went on to do such interesting things with his character, which we'll talk about under character progression in the next video. Across both seasons, Porky is a victim of a lot of Daffy's selfish schemes, but the interesting thing is, in the episode that serves as a flashback to their high school days, it turns out that Porky was a really popular kid in school who constantly bullied Daffy. I thought this was very clever because it makes Daffy somewhat sympathetic and probably explains why he's such a dysfunctional grown-up. He has a lot of suppressed trauma from school that he never dealt with. Ideally, Porky would be a very sympathetic character, but that episode goes a long way in making him less of a victim whenever Bugs and Daffy are mean to him. But sometimes Porky was just the architect of his own downfall. Bugs, for his part, starts out as Mr. Perfect, who can do no wrong, which is not the most endearing character trait, but as the show progresses, he gets more and more flawed, which was such a good direction to take the character in. 
The season also introduces Foghorn Leghorn, who I'll just call the rooster at this point, and his assistant Carol, who make for some of the funniest moments with Daffy Duck. Carol is the audience avatar in a lot of their scenes. Seeing her reactions to Rooster's bad decisions and her disdain for Daffy is always so, so funny. She's the only one who sees through the BS and you can't help but laugh every time. In subsequent episodes, she always referenced Daffy's last screw-up, which is really funny but is also so good for continuity. The actions of the characters in every episode build on each other and come to matter later, which adds to the weight of every character interaction. No scene is wasted. Overall, my favorite episodes in season 1 which I haven't mentioned yet are Eligible Bachelors, which was basically that visit to grandma's house where she tells you all her old war stories. Very wholesome episode. There was also Peel of Fortune where Daffy got rich by stealing Bugs' invention and their fortunes switched. We got to see what would happen if Daffy had all the money and Bugs was broke. This was the start of a recurring theme on the show where it was safer for Bugs to continue enabling Daffy's lack of ambition. This theme would be explored further in the Working Duck episode where Daffy got fired from his security job at the bank for falling asleep during a robbery. Bugs then pushed him to pull his weight and get another job. As a callback to another episode, Daffy met Rooster and Carol again while he was working as a muffin man for the Rooster's company and Rooster ended up making him the CEO because he likes Daffy and he's not very smart. Daffy failed upwards a lot on this show and it was always so good how they wrote him into those situations. Bugs came in to check on Daffy's progress at Enormacorp which I just realized is short for Enormous Corporation. <laughs> Anyway, Bugs discovered that Daffy was the new CEO and he was obviously confused and skeptical because Daffy had only been there for a day. And I loved when Daffy asked Bugs why his personal growth was so threatening to him. <laughs> Ultimately, when Daffy caused the collapse of the company leading to the loss of over 100,000 jobs and the potential collapse of the world economy, <laughs> Bugs said that he should have continued enabling him. I liked how after all the nonsense that Daffy did out there in the world, he could always return to the safety of Bugs' house and watch his mistakes on TV. This show was written in such an intelligent way where the different characters would go on wildly divergent paths, but their adventures would all coalesce at the end in the most satisfying ways. There's no better example of this in season 1 than Off Duty Cop, where Daffy was role playing as a detective and Bugs got addicted to some illegal caffeine substitute. Their paths went really far from each other but came together in the end in such a hilarious way. I can't believe I forgot to introduce Dr. Weisberg. We'll talk about him in season 2. This particular episode was also an indication that they were prepared to give Bugs Bunny major flaws that no previous version had done before. This made Bugs feel very real flawed and sympathetic, which will always endear an audience to a character. There's also the community aspect of this show where Bugs' favorite hangout spot at a pizza place was shutting down, so he bought the business and hired Speedy to run it, so that he could continue to have a place to hang out. You would be lying if you said that there wasn't a fantasy somewhere in the recesses of your mind to be able to buy a whole business that is closing just because you like hanging out there. Man, this video is already running so long. What do we need to say before we wrap part one? Okay, double date where Daffy meets Tina Russo and Bugs officially starts dating Lola. The float where Daffy embezzles money from Porky to buy a yacht, which was one of the most psychotic things I've ever seen Daffy do. And the shelf where Bugs epically fails trying to build a shelf through complete hubris. These were all must watch episodes. I also have to call back to an earlier point about Daffy before I close this one out. As much as he appears to be completely inept, he took a cosmetology class and became really good at it. This was an element of Daffy's character and growth that would not get lost and carried over to later episodes in season 2. Did I mention the Newspaper Thief episode where Daffy invited all his neighbors to dinner? They thought he was inviting them to apologize for being a truly horrible neighbor, but he was actually inviting them to accuse one of them of stealing his newspaper in a classic murder mystery type scheme where he was supposed to weed out the culprit. The ending of this episode was so wholesome and the second ending was hilarious. Okay, I have to hard stop here because new thoughts are just flooding into my brain and this is already much longer than I intended, but I'll get into these other thoughts in the next video. Hopefully you'll be back for that. Let me know what your favorite season 1 moments were and I'll see you soon. Peace.